morning. 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 This is a great place. Wow. Um, just very honored to be able to come here. I want to thank everybody that uh, uh, has followed our story and kind of understand who we are. Thank you very much, Celeste, for the introduction. Um, let's see if I can get this work. Okay, great. Good deal. <laughs> check, check. Credit card. Okay, um, there's an old saying. You can take the boy out of the mountains, but you can't take the mountain out of the boy. You heard that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's very true, true with me. Uh, I'm born in, in Pikeville, actually grew up in Biggs Branch, Kentucky, and this is a holler. <laughs> I grew up there, um, and actually go back there when I go to Pikeville, I currently live in Lexington, to um, stay with my aunt and uncle. Uh, so when I'm working at BitSource, I get to go back home. Now if you don't know the holler, there's kind of like two places in a holler. The mouth of the holler, which is, and I'm saying it right, holler. <laughs> which is the confluence of two streams. The smaller stream meets the larger stream like a river. The head of the holler is sort of the farthest upgrade from where the stream is. I'm from the head of the holler. This qualifies for me as a term called creeker. I qualify for that term. I'm a creeker. And we have Tate's Creek. Okay, my wife is from Lexington, and I put the wrong emphasis on Tate's Creek, because it's, it's a creek, right? So you have to put the emphasis on creek. Well, back home, there's all kinds of creeks. So the emphasis is on the name of the creek. It's very interesting. <laughs> so here's where I'm from, Biggs Branch. And then this is where BizSource is located, the, excuse me, the little yellow uh, indicator. And then, of course, where we are today. The reason I highlighted that is there's two hours and 46 minutes there, okay? 152 miles. So in the last four years, I've logged almost 66,000 miles going back and forth. Uh, try to estimate exactly how many hours I've spent on the Mountain Parkway, and I think it's like 400 and something. I've spent about 200 nights away from, 280 actually, away from my family. You know, so this is intention. This is the cost of being intentional. And there is a cost. <clears throat> These mountains are beautiful, and it's totally worth it. If you've never been to the hills of eastern Kentucky, I want to invite you. No matter where you go or how long you stay, this will always be home to me. And I've talked to several this morning who share that same view from, from Pikeville, from eastern Kentucky, and have, have moved this way to further their career. So, uh, as you heard Celeste mention, in January of 2000, I had back surgery uh, due to a combination of injury, genetics, we'll go into it. But it took me about a year to recover. Uh, it took six months to diagnose the issue. And during that time, uh, I couldn't walk, and I lost a job, um, and the issue became progressively worse. So it kind of left me thinking, what am I going to do? So uh, I put my computer beside of me and uh, on, my, on the floor of my home, and I learned how to code. Um, my intention was to reinvent myself uh, in order to stay home, in order to be relevant. <clears throat> so uh, after I recovered, I took several small jobs. And by the way, in 2000, I refer to this as BG before Google. <laughs> so trying to learn uh, how to code nowadays, much easier. You have so many resources, you've got a, you know, wonderful programs like Awesome Inc. And um, being able to do that now, compared to when I started, it's a totally different paradigm. Uh, I, I've got an order <clears throat> that I've kept from Amazon uh, with my first books that I bought kind of interesting. And uh, my uncle, uh, Danelle, he actually bought me software when I first started and told him I was going to try to do this. Dreamweaver 1. Oh, wow. 
in Flash 2, <laughs> or ActionScript. So, uh, so yeah, it's kind of interesting. But in February 2001, after I recovered, uh, I moved to Lexington, Kentucky, because there were no tech opportunities in the mountains. I decided I'm going on an adventure. <laughs> I guess that, that correlated, right? Okay. <clears throat> and I left the friendly confines of the Shire. And that was really tough. That was a transition. And I'm sure you speak to anybody that has made that transition, they'll kind of say the same thing. Not only is it a, a culture shock, but this it's a little different. The worlds are totally different. Even though they're, like I pointed out, they're just two hours and 46 minutes away, the Eastern Kentucky and Central Park are really kind of different. They're the same, but they're very different too. Let me introduce you to two people who are very intentional. Lynn Parrish and Rusty Justice. And unfortunately, Lynn's picture didn't come through. It's a little grainy. It's because he's hard to capture. <laughs> if these two had not stepped out of their comfort zone, none of this would have happened. They took an incredible risk to be where we are today. And uh, we're very fortunate to have them as uh, leaders and elders, in a way, uh, in this business. Rounding out our leadership team is Peyton May. He's our creative, oper uh, creative director and chief operating officer. Uh, Peyton combines amazing creativity uh, with the love of our place and our people. We are very different individuals. <laughs> But together we make a pretty good team. Uh, still committed to, you know, after four years, our original intention of creating a vibrant and robust tech sector in the mountains. So that Appalachians can stay in Appalachia and earn a living equivalent to the ones that were provided by the coal industry. Here we are recently at Google's headquarters in Mountain View with the head of Creative Labs at Google, Josh Rosen, for a fireside chat. And it was really interesting because they bought t-shirts that said BitSource and had them on the back, and devs were wearing their shirts. It was just, you know, that floored me. What a compliment. <clears throat> now meet the heroes of this story. Ten unemployed former coal miners who began their second career with the intention of, as a BitSource employee, I need to learn how to code. <clears throat> so let me describe this picture a little bit. As you see in the background to the top right, in the background is a picture of the Mercury 7. Am I familiar with Mercury 7? They were sort of the um, first team to kind of start the program of can we get to the moon, can we get to outer space? We've always told them from the beginning, you guys, ladies and gentlemen, are those people, Mercury 7. You're doing something that's never been done before. And so we've told them that many, many times. And finally, they decided to take this picture, which was sort of a reenactment of the Mercury 7 picture where they're all gathered, gathered around the Mac instead of the, the rocket uh, that took uh, the space expansion into the next level. So they're the ones proving our intentions are realistic. <clears throat> they're the ones that have validated our intention of code to code, that effort. Uh, this is a lapel pin that Google gave us when we went to the Fireside Chat. They created it. It's the Chrome browser with the code to code tag. I wish it was coming to the W3C standard, but it's not. <laughs> Just kidding. So how do we begin our effort? We were intentional about three objectives. Reimagination. Imagine yourself in a place where you just have never seen or have never had anyone model for you what your job is supposed to look like. And you've just come from a place where you become unemployed and you can't provide for your family. Okay? <clears throat> really, really tough. So what we had to do was to tell them, 
you're just like those guys in the Mercury 7, those astronauts, doing something that's never been done before. So, to give you kind of a perspective, we hired 11. Uh, but one person declined to go, to, to take the job, and he said, I can't do this stuff. I'm just a dumb old coal hunter. So we knew that we had to do some things to breathe life and equip and support our group before we could even look at any code. <clears throat> they had the ability to do the job and the desire, but they needed to reinvent. <coughs> We were intentional about computational thinking. They had to become different types of problem solvers. As you probably heard, I've uh, kind of described them as engineers that get dirty. Coal miners are engineers that get dirty. And when you're a coal miner, you're, you're still a problem solver every day, okay? And so it related well. What we needed to do, though, was to present questions to them how does a computer work? How do you talk to a computer? How do you write code to make a computer do what you want? And so we kind of went down that road where we had to almost take, and this is a bad analogy because it doesn't really exist, but a tool belt and a pickaxe and replace it with it, command line, sublime, those kind of things. All my developer guys are like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We were intentional about digital literacy. We believe that there's um, a problem amongst entrepreneurs and also um, anyone that's in, getting into the, the tech world. There's a digital literacy. There's not like a baseline or a standard. We all know this, right, across the board. You're an entrepreneur, a business owner, you should have this level of digital literacy for uh, tech. That doesn't exist. So we had to tell them what was possible in tech. The tech world became demystified. They began to see behind the curtain and learn what was possible with things like websites, apps, and so on. How did we achieve these objectives? We implemented standards. Agile software development. Has anybody heard of Agile? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, the first story that the developers took was, as a bit source employee, I need to learn how to code. And the size is pretty, pretty large. Um, we, we taught agile scrum, sprints, epic stories, backlogs, points. We added to their knowledge base and also um, just their understanding of how these concepts work. We implemented Google Apps, Google Docs, Hangouts, Slack, Git, Command Line, Sublime, all these things that are, that are standard in any other company. As a matter of fact, we went to Google and we've had them come into our office and they said, this looks just like Google. You know, it's no different. Any other tech company, anywhere. <clears throat> we established a learning culture. Discomfort is a desired state. I stand before you today, I don't like to speak, and I'm not very comfortable. <laughs> but, if you want to grow, you have to be uncomfortable. Discomfort is a desired state when you're learning, when you're trying to do something new. Because we want them to fail fast, fail often, and fail forward. Our team uh, was built to scrum the ball across the line. And in their 22-week apprenticeship, they were able to learn from each other. Uh, they learned about each other's failures and successes as they collaborated. And they were all very, very uncomfortable in doing that. But it was worth it, because after they came out on the other side, now this is something that we do often. In other words, um, we call it the pit of despair. There's a great article where you just kind of jump off the edge and go down the pit of despair. And you have to climb your way back out. And so that's what we taught them. And so we often refer to something as, that looks like a pit of despair. Yes, it is. Who's ready to jump? <laughs> so some devs gravitated toward front end, some devs graduated toward back end, but it was a team effort, and they began to complement each other uh, based on strength and weaknesses on the fact that 
let's be uncomfortable together. We adopted open source, Drupal, Xamarin, Unity. We've also done some WordPress. Uh, we use things like Bootstrap, jQuery, C Sharp, JSON, MySQL, all those things. They let us go to market faster and build solutions for clients based on the contributions of thousands of developers. And we contribute back. That's the way it works. <clears throat> Someone once said, standing on the shoulders of giants. Open source allowed us to deconstruct existing solutions, learn best practices, and understand how to contribute in a shared environment. As a result, we went to market with the ability to provide solutions locally, regionally, and now we're working with clients nationally. Technology in itself has been proven to be very, very disruptive especially to old ways of doing business. There's a few there that you probably see and recognize. Netflix, Uber, Airbnb, to name a few. Um, more are making their mark each day. They are intentional problem solvers. Our intention is for technology to disrupt poverty. Technology can disrupt poverty, especially in the area that I've got highlighted there, which Rusty kind of refers to affectionately as Southwest Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> but the intention, our intention, is to take what we've been given with this opportunity with the press and some of this information uh, that has come out about us and turn it into something that we believe that technology can disrupt poverty. Questions? Yes. We are actually participating with local uh, schools and the Girls Code movement, uh, so we're working with them. Um, we have one female actually on our staff. Uh, we actually have another one that's uh, sort of a temporary that does design work. So we're trying to be more diverse as we go forward because we do recognize that it's a very male-driven um, um, uh, industry. But as we have turned the page and in the cold to code movement, uh, we're ready to diversify as a company. And, and one of the things we're doing is with uh, cold, uh, the uh, girls who code, and then also through the uh, school system locally. Yes, ma'am. How many people do you employ? Right now, 13. And then how many have worked with you even outside that 13? How many have learned to do this? <clears throat> Not understanding, sorry. Like, um, the 13 we have now are the nine developers that we started with, plus people that we have brought on uh, in management and also design. So, um, and most of these people we did not know before. Yes? What type of projects do you work on and what's holding you back from making it bigger? <clears throat> so we've completed over 100 projects now. And they have mostly um, been websites, brochure, and B2B apps, progressive web apps uh, for other businesses. And we've developed uh, mobile apps, and then also augmented reality experiences. Um, digital literacy is a big thing that holds us back in our area locally. Uh, also, the coal economy, you lose a billion dollars in so many years, 10,000 jobs as a four to one factor. A lot of companies aren't going to exist even if they don't do anything with the coal industry. So those companies that are here that stand up, most of the tech companies design social media apps that, that are app driven, um, they can kind of exist here. We're, we're, we're trying to talk to them now regionally uh, so that we can, we, we say we've exported coal for a long time, now we want to export code. So what we want to be able to do is work regionally as well as the, with the companies that we have locally. And that's really the thing that's holding us back. We have 31 uh, projects that are being quoted right now. So that's a, that's a pretty good amount. If they were all, if they were to all hit, 
we would have to scale. So that's a very good problem to have. Yes? Are there other companies, tech or otherwise, that sort of have your philosophy or doing that work going back into the mining trade and opportunities for people there? Um, that you know of? Or? Yeah, there's one company, because uh, we, we're a sore inspired company shaping our Appalachian region. And so we've worked with a lot of companies that work with SOAR, and one company, um, especially Central App, specializes in Salesforce. And so they were able to do something similar, take unemployed people and build them up as Salesforce developers. Was that, does that answer your question? Yeah, well, so what's SOAR then? I haven't heard of that. SOAR, shaping our Appalachian region. Jared Arnett, uh, he's the uh, leader of that group, and he's worked with them. They're a nonpartisan uh, organization started by a um, uh, previous governor and then also uh, Harold Rogers. Yes? Um, so you talked about like, digital literacy as far as uh, you know, the knowledge barrier coming in. Um, when you see people who aren't coders in the field, what's generally like the largest social barrier? Mm. And like an example of what I mean is like when you first start and you need help, everyone tells you to go to Stack Exchange, which is <laughs> yeah. the most unwelcome thing. Well, that's a good question. Well, you know, um, I had this in the, slot, uh, the deck and I took it out, but um, there's a book written in the 70s called uh, Megatrends, mm -hmm. and it talks about how. Um, as an information society, we're going to increase in tech and become high tech, and then we'll become siloed. We're going to use devices. I mean, the dude was right. It was in the seventies, um, and he also says afterwards we must also increase in high touch. And I think that developers, especially because they're mostly internal focus or just their their personality is a little different, uh, the social barrier there is to have developers to be champions and say, you know, I want to uh, have more of a relationship with other devs, not just send you to Google and say Google that. <laughs> and I think that's been one of our, um, the things that we've been successful at. Because I could have just sent them, I'll just Google it, oh, it's on this. But instead I sat beside them, worked with them, said let's go, do, let's go down the pit of despair together. And so I think that's a big deal uh, today. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, one of SOAR's priorities was the broadband connectivity in the region. Um, is the infrastructure there still a barrier in your growth? In our growth? Um, yeah. Long and short of it, yeah. Um, you know, we use a lot of cloud-based technologies. Um, we do have, we don't have the best internet speeds, so we're not doing anything like telemedicine. But it would be nice to have a 20-person hangout, not stutter and <clears throat> just one time <laughs> but uh, yeah and I think they're making progress uh, we realize there's definitely a deficiency and to have an equal playing field to be able to participate in the in the 21st century digital economy you know we've got to have a level playing field but there's really realistically there's uh, unlevel playing fields across the world so if we can improve and get better and encourage those that are in charge to do that uh, faster, then that would be great. Yes? Can you tell us a little bit about your funding sources, how you got started, and are you self-sufficient now, or how does that work? Yeah, uh, so in the beginning, we partnered with uh, EKSET, Eastern Kentucky Concentrated Employment Program. And so for every uh, $1 of um, funds that they were to provide for their program, uh, to meet out of work coal miners, we had four dollars of private funding, and so that was in the beginning. Uh, we're now self-sufficient. Um, our projects scale and drop just like any other company. So, uh, but we're hoping this year is our is our year. Yes. What was the initial reception from prospective clients, and how did you quell any fears that they might have? Okay, well, there's a real story 
that I've told a few times that uh, somebody I've known and worked with for a long time, I went to them early on, hey, we're going to do this. What do you think? And they said, I can't, hold, I can't hire coal miners as coders. You know, I can't sell that to a client. And so um, it's one of those things that now the conversation has kind of changed. We've proven we can do this. We are doing it. And so I think the more repetitions, the more games we can play, <laughs> um, the better off that we're going to be in, in showing our book of business and our portfolio. Uh, one good thing is we've had MIT, Carnegie Mellon, Google, and Red Hat all look at our procedures and look at our work, and they say, this doesn't look anything different than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. So that person that wouldn't hire you initially, have you gone back to them, or have they changed their outlook on your company? <clears throat> Not yet. I'm waiting for them to call me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I know a little bit of your background, and one of the things you did before code was baseball. <laughs> so is there anything that you learned from your, your baseball career that uh, is, has played into your career now? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> when you look at a batter's batting average, you know, the Hall of Fame, I think, standard is that you're successful three out of ten times. And mine was a lot less. <laughs> so, uh, but it taught me a whole lot. You know, fell forward, fell fast. You know, fell off and fell forward. So, um, and then, you know, we don't win or lose, we just run out of innings. But we can count wins for certain things, maybe not measured by other people in the same way. Yes. Just looking at you know, three to five years from now, what are your plans in terms of how many uh, miners you want to turn into your voters and how many projects you have? We want to be a little bit more diverse as we go forward. We still want to, we have a social mission. Okay, I, I attended a talk not too long ago, um, and, a, and a gentleman talked about how you have to have an impact model and a business model. And so our impact model, of course, is to go out and and our mission is to provide jobs to those in Appalachia, tech jobs. So we want to continue to do that. But also we see a need to build in other areas uh, to offer new services. And, and those may not necessarily translate to um, a tech-minded uh, underground, previous underground worker. So things like social media, video, 3D, all those kind of things, um, and and we're looking to expand in that area. Yes, sir. Um, have you all, rather than a shotgun approach, have you thought about trying to develop talent that can do very specific kinds of things? Like, very, like I just, I'm in the software business too. I'm hiring some consultants out of New Zealand right now that build anywhere from 350 to 550 an hour, right, for their work. So it's very specialized things that are going on that yeah. you need talent for. Uh, but, but also, I'll use the term up the stack, you know, business, business analytics, business intelligence kinds of things that don't require really deep coding knowledge, but, you know, people that get good at knowing, you know, how to glue, glue information together yes. uh, is, is in more and more demand. I think mean, there are going to be things where individuals could build, you know, very specialized expertise in. Yes, um, we're actually working with uh, Google to uh, identify data scientists. Yes. I think it's kind of what you described as a data scientist that could look at uh, information because really when you look at machine learning, uh, especially what Google is offering with their TensorFlow, um, <coughs> you don't really need a programmer to do that kind of work. And so it's a data scientist. Can I look across, see design patterns, see information be able to tie them together, correlate, and then let the machine do its work. It's the first time I've ever seen a developer refer to something as magic. <laughs> <laughs> and so so if if uh, if we can all not be muggles and just kind of go forward and learn that magic, <laughs> that'd be great uh, as data scientists. <laughs> yes. 
What are your selling points for individuals who grow up in the Appalachia area who maybe would have the opportunity to go to college elsewhere um, and you, you want to potentially track back at some point? And then also for individuals who aren't from that area who could benefit by being in that region and benefit you by being there? Yeah. Um, good questions. Uh, some of the first emails that we got were from people that were not uh, around this. You know, they were in different places, New York, Alabama, and they said, hey, if you build this, I'll come back. Because of their love of the mountains. So for those people that are away, you know, there's an appeal for the mountains and the beauty and just being able to go outdoor, hit the trails, do whatever you want to do there, you know, outdoors. Um, but then also those that are growing up there, this is a little bit of a, a, a bit source of hope way for them because now they can stay home they can go to school locally or if they go away they can come back it's not I've got to leave you know I've got to leave the Shire it's a it's a real possibility that they can come back and participate and grow and and, and be in the tech sector any other questions good question um, well, if no other questions, I'll be more than happy to talk to and connect with you after this. Um, I was hoping to uh, not just go up here and speak and tell you things, but also connect with each one of you possibly. Um, and so, um, yeah, thank you very much for coming, and I hope you had a good time.